As the setting sun fades beyond the horizon, the sound of drums beating rhythmically, persistently, ring out across the land. A canoe with two carb warriors moves swiftly through the waters towards the seashore. In two great strides, the warriors leap from the canoe and race along the shore. One of them carries a heavy sack over his shoulder. As they run, the drums beat out a message, unknown to some, but not those of the tribe known for its fierce warriors. In a short while, the two tribesmen arrive at their campsite. The scene is one not uncommon to the Carib tribe. Their venture to another island has been successful and it's time to dance and thank the gods of the sea. A group of warriors with painted faces and feathered necklaces dance frantically in the middle of the camp. Without a word, the warrior with the sack tosses it to the ground. The drums beat louder as the warriors begin to dance around the sack. Something is moving inside. Okay everyone, that's the ending of our DVD for today. You'll see the ending on Monday. Aww, please sir, don't stop the DVD. We want to see the end. Michael's classmates seem to echo her sentiments by moaning out loud in disappointment. Aww. Yes, please, teacher, sir. What's inside the sack? You can't leave us like this, Mr. Lewis. It's a long weekend to wait to see the ending. <laughs> but it will be just long enough for you to write your own exciting ending for this story. Use your imagination. And of course, all the material in this mystery bag that I am giving you. They were given to us by our friends from the Media Resource Department. Jumping from his desk, Nicholas rushed forward. He loved gifts and free giveaways, so his friends called him Freebie. Nicholas, you have to wait. Please, sir, tell Nicholas he has to wait. Of course, this made no difference to Nicholas, who stood resolutely by the teacher's desk. Come on, everybody. Take a mystery sack as you make your way out. Have a safe and enjoyable weekend, okay? And remember... Do all of your homework and everyone must present the ending of this story on Monday morning. Is that clear? Okay. One by one, the children took their mystery bags from the teacher's desk. Expressions of anxiety, expectancy, and just plain old reluctance could be seen as each child passed by. Finally, the last bag was taken and Mr. Lewis looked up to see Bradley Foster looking at him with some concern on his face. What's the matter, Bradley? You look a bit worried. I can't do this assignment, Mr. Lewis. I don't know anything about the car people. So I guess I'll be in trouble on Monday. Tell me why you think you can't do this assignment, Bradley. Well, teacher, I don't have a computer like some of the others. So I can't gather all the information for an exciting story. Shaking his head, Mr. Lewis drew Bradley closer so he could look him squarely in the eyes. Bradley, remember what I told you. I've given you some information in this bag that will help you. There are sources other than the internet that you can use to gather information. And sometimes the story you need is inside here. Think about what you saw in the DVD and have a look at what's inside the bag. Talk to people, ask questions about the care people. And most of all, Bradley, never give up on anything before you try, okay? I'm sure your story will be exciting. So hurry along and just do your best. A broad smile broke out on Bradley's face as he clutched his mystery bag and headed out of the classroom. Teacher was counting on him and he could not help but wonder what was inside his mystery bag. Bradley is home, curled up on the floor with his mystery bag in front of him. Around him are objects from his bag, including what looks like a scrapbook. He fiddles with an object from the bag. What am I going to do with this? I hope it's not a bone. But if it is, what animal did it come from? 
Ugh. What else do you have in your mystery bag, Bradley? Oh, hmm. I have a piece of fabric, some shells, two long feathers, a piece of string, and some straw. Looks like you have to make something with what you've got in your bag in addition to writing that story ending. Yup. Teacher said we must be creative and make something that the Caribs would have made years ago. I am not sure what I'm going to make yet, but I think I'm going to like this part of the project. Look here, Bradley. This is very interesting. Your scrapbook from the mystery bag is full of images of the tribe you're studying. Here, take a look. Squeezing into the sofa chair with his dad, Bradley peered into the scrapbook. One by one, he turned the pages, his eyes popping open at some of the images. Here, look at this one. It shows the lifestyle of the Caribs. Let's read what it says at the bottom, Daddy. The Caribs were one of many Amerindian tribes who lived in South America many years ago. They arrived in the Caribbean later than the Arawaks, and they fought the Arawaks for many of the islands. They occupied the Windward and Leeward Islands northwest of Puerto Rico. They were a hunting and warlike people, and offered greater resistance to the Spanish. They fought fiercely to repel European invaders, and to defend their lands, homes, and liberties. Wow! Daddy, they were warriors! I've never seen a Carib warrior. Are any of them still alive? Well, remember it says here that the Caribs lived on the islands many, many years ago. Their descendants, however, who still live on the island of Dominica. They remind me of the Arawaks, Daddy. Mr. Lewis taught us about the Arawaks during last school term. The Caribs were taller than the Arawaks. They were of medium height and of light brown complexion. They were described as being stronger than the Arawaks, largely because of the emphasis on training and fighting. Like the Arawaks, the Caribs wore no clothing except for a small cotton apron worn by the women. The women painted their bodies with a red dye and made fantastic decorations in many colors. The paint they used was made by mixing oil with boiled and ground seeds from the Bixa plant. The paint was brushed over the whole body, partially for decoration and also for protection against insects. On ceremonial occasions, men used black paint. They had their wives paint streaks over their faces and bodies. In order to look fierce when they went into battle, the Caribs made deep scars on their faces with agouti teeth, painted white rings around their eyes. With a frown on his face, Bradley turned to his dad. Anaguti? What's anaguti, Daddy? Anaguti is a dark brown rodent about the size of a rabbit. Listen here, Bradley. Like the Arawaks, the Caribs also had straight, long black hair, which they combed and dressed with oil. The hair was considered a sign of beauty. They wore it long, cutting the part only above the eyes. They let it hang freely, or sometimes bunch part of it on the back of the head, tying it with a cotton cord and decorating it with tail feathers of the macaw. It was the women's duty to comb and oil the men's hair daily. Before the men traveled, the women would comb the men's hair and grease it with oil to make it shine and look blacker. Sharp edge grass was used in the place of scissors for trimming the hair. The Caribs had short heads and it was customary to flatten the foreheads and back of a child's head as this was thought to be a sign of beauty. Indeed, beautifying the body also involved piercing the ears, nose and lower lip for insertion of fish bones, feathers, stone pendants or pieces of wood, stone or shells. Both men and women wore bracelets made of cotton or beads. Men wore the bracelets on the upper arm whilst women wore them around their wrists. Native-born women were distinguished from captives by wearing anklets made of basketry interwoven with cotton. Both men and women wore necklaces and girdles from the same material. Do you see how very different they look from us, Bradley? Remember what we discussed last week? 
Uh, not really. Well, I told you that even though people may look different from us, we ought to respect them and not laugh and make fun of their appearance. Daddy, Daddy, look at this necklace. It says here it's made of small bones and teeth of victims. Wow, is that the same bone teacher gave us in the mystery bag? Do you think? <laughs> no, no, Bradley. <laughs> That's not a bone that teacher gave you. It's a piece of material that looks like a bone. I think teacher wants you to use it to be creative like the Caribs. Make something that reminds you of the Caribs. What does it say at the bottom? The Caribs made necklaces out of seashells and transparent fish bones, agouti teeth, seeds, and coral, and made holes in their lips and earlobes, into which they inserted smooth fish bones and other ornaments. Wow. I bet I can make something that's fierce and looks much better than Nicholas's. is. He's not good at crafts at all, Daddy. <laughs> Let's continue. The Caribs were expert canoeists and navigators who traveled from island to island raiding the Arawak settlements in large dugout canoes. They were experts in boat making. They had four types of boats, pirogues, small canoes, large canoes and rafts. The pirogues were large boats measuring up to 12 meters. These vessels were capable of carrying 30 to 40 men. Both the pirogues and the canoes were dugouts. Each one had a keel, a raised and pointed bow, and a set of plank seats. The small canoe was just large enough for one person and was used mainly for fishing. The rafts were a number of logs lashed together to two bars. The Caribs did outstanding basketry and weaving. They made outstanding baskets. The basket had double walls separated by a lining of leaves which made them watertight. Large rectangular baskets turned upside down and fitted with wooden legs served as tables. This basketry technique was used also in the manufacture of strainers, sieves, and mats. Besides carving canoes of wood, the Carib workmen also made bowls and stools. Unlike the Arawaks, the clay pottery and art of the Caribs was very rough. They did not take time to create fancy designs like the Arawaks. Painting was done on canoes, hammocks and gourds. It seems like a lot of work. What about fun stuff, games, and picnics for the children? Hmm. It says here that the Caribs enjoyed wrestling and boat racing, which is not quite what children would do. <laughs> but there were feasts that were held on regular occasions. For example, they would celebrate whenever it was decided to engage in warfare to celebrate victories, the birth of the first male child, to initiate a new warrior or recovery from a disease. The Caribs also liked music very much, as well as singing and dancing. Singing was not confined to feasts, however. The men and women would often take part in singing to pass away the time. It's not surprising that most of the songs were about warfare. Dancing was confined to feasts and on such occasions there would be songs accompanied by drums, rattles, a stringed instrument and a flute. The men would play their flutes in the morning while their wives prepared breakfast. Carib men were fond of drinking and made several different kinds of beer from a mixture of sweet potatoes and manioc. And there's something surprising Bradley. Some of the Carib men who were warriors kept parrots as their pets and taught them to talk. Here, you read this part, Bradley. The Caribs were not very good farmers, but they were excellent hunters and fishermen. They often traveled back and forth among the islands, and as a result, became excellent seamen. They were better fishermen than the Arawaks, and were not afraid to go on long voyages. On such voyages, they would use the stars at night to find their way. Besides crops of cassava, yam, sweet potato, and maize, 
the carobs grew tobacco and cotton, which they spun and wove into small strips of cloth. Their farming plots were made somewhere from the village. It was the duty of the carob men to clear the land while the women tended the crops. The carobs ate almost the same food as the Arawaks, but had more protein in their diet. They relied less on cassava and maize, although they knew how to grow them. There were certain foods, however, that the carobs would not eat. For example, turtles and manatee, which they feared would make them slow like all those animals. In addition, the pig was not eaten for fear of having small, beady eyes, and eating crab before a sea voyage would surely bring storms. But what about pizza and chocolate cookies, Daddy? <laughs> no junk food for warriors, Bradley. No wonder they were so lean and fit. Besides, they had to be strong and agile for the battles they fought. Here's something you would like, Bradley. Carob soup. Carob soup was made from agouti bones and other leftovers, which were seasoned with pepper sauce, cassava flour, and oysters. Sometimes the carobs ate grilled fish cooked slowly over a wooden grid and served with a sauce called kui, along with sweet potatoes and yam. Their favorite dish was a stew made with crab and cassava. Food was seasoned with pepper but not salt. Wiki was a beer which they made with cassava and was consumed with great enthusiasm at festivals. What kind of houses did they have, Daddy? Bradley had seen what looked like strange looking buildings in the DVD at school and he wondered how the Caribs actually built their homes. Well, let's read about that, shall we? Carib villages were built in positions that could be defended against attacks and were preferred near streams where they could readily obtain drinking water and water for bathing. The Caribs would move their villages frequently after a death sickness or other disagreeable incident. Here are some pictures of houses and furniture. A carob village was usually small and consisted of a large building called a carbe where the men lived and smaller houses for women. The carbe was a rectangular building about 18 meters long and 6 meters wide. The floor was of dirt and there was a hearth in the center. There were no partitions and the only openings were a door and no more than 1.2 meters. The houses that surrounded the car bay were oval in shape and much smaller. Mats were used to cover the doorway of houses. Hammocks were the chief articles of furniture. Some hammocks were painted red or black. Outside the carriers built a small storehouse in which they kept their war clubs, household utensils, stone tools, and extra hammocks and beds. At night, candles made of a sweet-smelling gum lighted the homes. How do you like that, Bradley? I think I prefer our home, Daddy. I would, however, like to sleep in one of those cool-looking beds. Here's a picture of a lad like you, Bradley. Life wasn't easy for young boys then. Would you like to trade places with this little boy? Oh no, Daddy. It looks like he's not playing. He's working. It says, at age four, carib boys were taken from their mothers to live with the men in the carib bay. The carib men believed that the women were soft and weak, and if a boy was to become a warrior, he should move away from the influence of women unless he was to be trained as a priest. Carib boys were trained to make and use weapons. They were taught how to use the bow and how to apply poison to the arrowhead. To improve their marksmanship, the young warriors in training had to shoot their meals down from the tops of trees and learn to shoot accurately while swimming. Courage was considered to be the greatest virtue by the Caribs. The boys were taught to bear pain without flinching. When they reached the age of 14 or 15, they had to pass what's called an initiation test to become warriors. Part of the test was to endure pain 
by being scratched with an agouti's claw and having salt rubbed into the wound without crying out. Whew, that's not fun at all. And what's that strange looking object on the other page? That's called a ceremonial club. The Caribs worship ancestor spirits. They believed in good or evil spirits called Maboya, the most important of all Carib idols. The good spirits were believed to be invisible except at night when they took the form of bats. They believed that each Carib had one of these spirits. The evil spirits were attributed to all the frightening occurrences such as nightmares, sickness, thunder, hurricanes, earthquakes and the eclipse of the moon. It's not surprising then to learn that Caribs wore small carvings around their necks to frighten off evil spirits. The priests or medicine men were called boyes, and their chief function was to heal the sick and to call up spirits from the past. The boyes had special huts where they practiced their rites. Much preparation was made for war voyages. The Caribs would often post guards near harbors to watch for the approach of raiding parties. Their principal weapon was the bow and arrow, which was superior to that of the Arawaks. The bow was about 1.8 meters long, and the tip was poisoned. There were also javelins and clubs. The clubs varied in length according to the rank of the owner. Before going off on a raid, the Caribs would assemble to decide on their rendezvous. They would attack at night or dawn, when their enemies were asleep. The Carib warriors would be divided into three bands, and they would attack the village uttering war cries and shooting fire arrows. Arawak women were usually captured in these battles and carried off to become wives of the Carib warriors. Unfortunately, the Arawak men also suffered a terrible fate and were killed in fierce battles with the Carib warriors. It was not unusual therefore to find objects and practices in the Carib villages that were common to the Arawak tribe. The women and the children spoke the Arawak's language, whilst the men spoke the Carib's language. When the men and women spoke together, they spoke the Carib's language. The Caribs were not as organized as the Arawaks. In peace times, they had few laws, but in times of war, they employed stricter rules. There was always conflict between hunter and farmer. The Arawak farmers had little to do with the Carib hunters except when they were defending their homes against attacks. In the Windward Islands, the Caribs clearly established themselves through victory. Each raid saw a deeper intermixture of the Caribs and the Arawaks and forged the beginning of new societies. Look daddy, this picture shows the Caribs with Christopher Columbus a long, long time ago. In 1493, Christopher Columbus landed in Dominica with his men and his ships in search of gold and fortune. To his dismay, he found only rivers, rich volcanic soil, mountains, and an indigenous people, the Caribs. The Caribs had settled on Dominica, but their ancestors had come from South America, down the Oronico River, and then up the Caribbean Sea, where they settled on the most rugged of the islands in order to protect themselves from enemies. The Caribs welcomed Columbus and his men, and in return, Columbus worked them, almost to the verge of extinction. Here's a trail of the Caribs, Daddy. It tells me to plot the trail with these red dots. Do you know, Bradley, that the Caribs came from much further south than the Arawaks? They migrated across Brazil to the interior of Guyana, then north to the coast of Venezuela. They followed the Arawaks to the West Indies, moving from island to island in the Lesser Antilles, fighting and winning over the Arawaks that were already there. Apart from Barbados and most of Trinidad, the Caribs resettled most of the Eastern Antilles. Here's another picture that's interesting, Bradley. It shows the Caribs today. Despite the hardship they endured, they have been able to keep their traditions and culture alive. This reading says there are only 3,000 Caribs remaining in Dominica after years of brutal treatment by the Spanish, French and English. They live in eight villages on the east coast of the island 
on a 3,700 acre territory set aside for them in 1903. Collectively, these villages are called the Carib Territory. The Caribs today have their own chief and also a representative in the House of Assembly. They have sought to preserve their culture over the years through storytelling, crafts and dance. The language is only spoken by a few people today, but their traditional dances are performed by a group called the Carifuna. Unfortunately, many accounts written about the Caribs portray them as only fierce and warlike. However, any encounter with the Caribs today will show that they are uncomplicated people who rely on the earth and the sea for a living. Wow! I never knew all that stuff about the Caribs. And we learned all that from just this scrapbook alone? I'm sure there must be lots more information I can gather from other places, just like Mr. Lewis said I should. What are some of the things you remember from our reading? Well, I remember mostly that the Caribs were people of the sea. They traveled by canoe from island to island, and they were very fit and strong. They were creative too, making things with their hands, like pots and jewelry. And they were brave. They were hunters and warriors. Mr. Lewis told me I should not be afraid of things I have not tried. And the Caribs were not. They traveled to places they had never been before. And that's a good lesson for me, Daddy. I thought at first their appearance was strange with all the paint and shells. But I remember what you said about people who are different. There are some children at my school who look different. And there are some who are not even from our country. But I think, Daddy, if we try to learn about them, just like I did with the Caribs, perhaps we would learn something interesting about them too. Now that you've learned so much, Bradley, do you have any idea how your story is going to end? Oh yes! My imagination is flying already! I know how I want the story of the Caribs to end. And I can tell you, it's going to be great, Daddy! Grabbing his scrapbook and the items from his mystery bag, Bradley headed outside towards the coconut trees in his yard. The dried leaves and fallen branches would come in quite handy, he thought. With the images from his scrapbook and what he had learned about the Caribs, he was more than ready to create an exciting ending for his story. The evening was quiet but for the gentle rush of the sea waves against the shore. Looking over the horizon, Bradley stood transfixed. He could see the sun dipping lazily out of sight. Turning his head slightly, he listened intently. Was that, was that the sound of a drumbeat, he wondered? He could almost see the carb warriors dancing around the funny-looking sack on the ground. Bending down, Bradley started to collect pieces of leaves and branches. Oh yes, he thought, his story was definitely going to come alive.